began asking questions about human nature, essentially, because of your experiences during World War II, you began looking at why people seem so cruel to each other. Let's start there. Well, you know, I think that today we are beginning to understand that the so-called scientific objectivity uh, is in many ways something that is a figment of people's imagination. That yes, we must look at things from a perspective that is analytical, but that the kind of work that we choose to do, and even the kind of subjects that we choose to look at, really are very deeply rooted in our own life experiences. And certainly mine is such a case. Uh, I was a refugee child. Uh, my parents and I had to flee for our lives from Hitler's Europe. And so very early I really did have to ask myself questions that for me never have been academic. Questions like, do we really have to live this way? Do we have to hunt and persecute each other? Do we have to have all of this violence, this warfare, and also all of this tension, which of course, you know, this war of the sexes, mm -hmm. which my work shows that war and the war of the sexes are inextricably interrelated. So these questions uh, really were there for me. And in the 10-year study, from which the chalice and the blade derives, I really did set out using a, an interdisciplinary approach to deal with some of these questions. But there was also something else that made it possible for me to do this. And I think we were talking about you know, things that people consider given. Very early, when I was very young, I changed, first of all, I, I, I was born in Vienna, then we fled to Havana. In fact, we were on the last ship before a ship that some people are very well acquainted with. It was the St. Louis. And it was, there was a movie made about it, which mm. was called Voyage of the Damned. And it was a ship that was turned back to Nazi Europe so that the people died. So, uh, you know, I mean, that, that was quite an impact on my life. You, but, I, uh -huh. but I really, what I wanted to say is that going to, from, from Vienna to Cuba and then to the United States, I learned very early that the things that people consider given, just the way things are, that they're not the same everywhere. And that, too, was very, very important. Mm -hmm. You have made a career, in effect, out of challenging a, a dogma that, that many people assume it, it was ever thus. People have always been inhumane to each other. If, uh, uh, many scholars would say you can look as far back as ancient Egypt and you see they built the pyramids on slave labor. And, and I think you've made a, uh, a revolutionary claim when you suggest, well, we are capable of looking back even further than ancient Egypt and discovering that there was a time when we, in effect, lived in a Garden of Eden and in peace and harmony with each other. Well, you know, uh, we, I was telling you a little bit about this 10-year study from yes. which the chalice and the blade derives, and I think that one of the things that distinguishes my work from most other studies that are really concerned about these vital problems in our world today, you know, are we going to make it in this age of nuclear possibility of nuclear war and so forth, that the study takes into account the whole of our history, including our prehistory. And most important, perhaps, it, it uh, takes into account a database that includes the whole of humanity, both its female and its male half. And this really leads me to a very important thing. When we just look at part of a picture, we of course don't see the whole picture, but we also get a very distorted view. And a lot of the models for studying history have been very distorted. And one of these models in terms of looking at our history and at prehistory in particular was, for example, that prehistory is the story of man the hunter and man the warrior. Mm -hmm. And in order to have that approach, a lot of data that was there all the time was simply distorted, manipulated in some way, as we tend to do to make it fit into our world view. So I think that what this book has done and what this study has done is to really uh, it's like putting together the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, some of which were, are new because there's been a, what British archaeologist James Maillard calls a veritable archaeological revolution. But some of them were there all the time, mm -hmm. but we weren't able to see them because we had to keep making them fit, you know, into mm -hmm. the old view. And the story that we've been told, the s because we live by stories, you know, we humans, we really do. We live by stories and we live by images. And the story that we've been told, be it the story of original sin or the story of selfish genes, mm -hmm. both of which, not coincidentally, also go along with stories about the inevitability of male dominance, mm -hmm. that story is designed to maintain 
what I've called a dominator rather than a partnership model of society. And I think it's not coincidental that in our time, when the dominator model, well, when the blade is the nuclear bomb, when one more war could be our last, what, because at a certain level of technological development, the dominator model literally goes into self-destruct. I don't think it's accidental that we are now reclaiming for ourselves this archaeological data and being able to reconstruct a different story. Mm -hmm. And this really is what, in many ways, my work has been about, is to tell a story that is certainly more interesting, much more congruous, congruent with the best available scientific evidence, and yes, a more hopeful story about that most extraordinary of all adventures, which is, of course, our hum human adventure here on Earth. Mm -hmm. I think even as, as we rationalize it, we have uh, the 18th century model of, of Thomas Hobbes and Leviathan, that man is a beast and, and we form a social contract, we build a civilization for the purpose of, of protecting ourselves from our own bestial nature. Well, you see, what we're finding out, and of course many people throughout the ages mm -hmm. have really known this, even through the 5,000 years of what I call the dominator detour mm -hmm. of recorded history. We've known that we human beings have very, very choices. Mm -hmm. I mean, what distinguishes us from other animals basically is this, the tremendous flexibility that we have. So we can't talk about human nature in, a, in an abstract sense. We have to talk about human nature in the context of one of these two models of society. Mm -hmm. And yes, in the dominator model, what is constantly being reinforced, what we're constantly almost forced to be, is to bring out, you know, this aggressive and cruel and dominator mm -hmm. uh, part of the picture. But we also know that we have the possibility, look, we're the, we're the only species that has this really uh, articulated quest for beauty and for knowledge and for justice. Uh, we also have a tremendous capacity for those things. And as a matter of fact, look, the, the, thing, the picture that's now emerging is so fascinating because what we're, what we're beginning to find out, you know, you mentioned some of these earlier legends, and they've been clues, and the clues have been there all the time. What archaeology is now verifying is that these legends are actually based on fact. Mm -hmm. They got distorted along the way. And as a matter of fact, because what came later uh, was so tense and so awful and so brutal, mm -hmm. they looked back on them as paradise, yeah. you know, as something ideal. They were not ideal societies. But what we're now finding out is that the original direction in the mainstream of our cultural evolution was in this less tense, in this more natural direction that I've called mm -hmm. the partnership rather than the dominator mm -hmm. model. And the good news is that what's happening today so much of what's happening in our world today is not new or radical. You know, the women's movement, the peace movement, the international ecology movement, all the movements for social and economic and racial justice, but they're really part of another partnership resurgence, reconnecting us with these very mm -hmm. early cultural roots. Mm -hmm. In other words, most of us who have been educated to believe that human history goes back three, four, five thousand years, and that's all there is, are, are sort of lost uh, in that history. Perhaps in the distant future, people will view this phase of our history as, as a brief aberration. Well, you know, I think that, uh, as I said, there's been a revolution in archaeology. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we're finding out, see, the, the way that they used to date things was sort of funny. If something was fairly advanced, say it was found in the Balkans, yes. they said, well, it must have been a Greek colony, about 600 BC. Well, now, comes along Willard Libby with radiocarbon dating. He got the Nobel Prize for that. And we're finding out that instead of 600 BC, it was about 6,000 BC. So that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. But even more important, because archaeology is a much more scientific discipline. You know, it isn't just this sort of grave robbing thing of looking for treasures for the big museums, the way it started in the 19th mm -hmm. century to a very large extent. Uh, but it's really an interdisciplinary science to try to reconstruct how, and, and, and really much more systematic, from, from the remains of houses, from the way people buried, from, you know, they're mm -hmm. dead, and of course from the art, which is tremendously important, how people viewed the world and how they lived in it. And what we're finding out is tremendously exciting because what we're finding out is not only that civilization uh, is much older than was previously believed, that there wasn't just this one cradle of civilization in Sumer, uh, you know, about 3200 BC, but that there were many cradles of civilization, all of them thousands of years earlier, 
and that these cradles of civilization were structured very differently from the way that we've been told civilization always has been and then by implication mm -hmm. always must be structured. Let's go back to the time of the agricultural revolution, which I, I think would take us back to the early Neolithic That's period, right. eight to 10,000 years ago. Right. That, uh, I think Alvin Toffler, the futurist, calls it the first great revolution in human history. Well, you see, uh, <coughs> most of the work that's been done, and I think that uh, Toffler certainly has done you know, some very interesting work, has uh, focused only on what I call the technological phase changes. Mm -hmm. But they have not focused on another principle, which is, I think, even more important in many ways, which is the tension both through prehistory and history between these two possible choices for us, the partnership model and the dominator model. Uh, if we look at the Neolithic, not only as a great technological revolution, but also in terms of a technological revolution in a time where in the heartland, you know, in mm -hmm. the, where, the, where agriculture could flourish, where, you know, the earth was a good mother to us, and because these people worshipped a great goddess. Uh, Mother Earth. Well, they had what we today call an ecological consciousness, okay? Because they really literally revered, you know, the, the, the life-giving powers of the Earth. But if we look at these, these societies from the perspective that this was a tremendous technological revolution that took place in the context of a partnership rather than a dominator mm -hmm. model of society, a lot of things become much more interesting uh, and much more clear. Mm -hmm.